the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. When does a look become a leer, become a thought, become a fantasy, become flirting, and then become an act? Over the years, 15 years now doing this job, I have seen a few too many times the devastating impact of adultery on a family as a couple's life. This huge sense of betrayal that they would do that with them to me. This crushed, especially when it's totally out of the blue, devastated, uh, deeply filled with agony, heart. And then after a little while, fierce anger that somebody could make those choices. And then often after that, deep depression, and always this frantic questioning to know why and how, and tell me how this happened. What what exactly happened? And the question of, will I ever be able to trust another person completely with me again? When a person who is supposedly in a committed relationship strays, they take what should only be given to the one they're with, and they give it to another. They give away their love or their attention or their hearts or their imaginations or their bodies. When they do that, it's just wrong. It's wrong if it's happened to you, and it's wrong if you are the perpetrator and made it happen to somebody else and to yourself. Because both hearts get wrecked when adultery happens. When a love that's meant to be exclusive and pure gets divided and diluted and disintegrated, lives are wrecked. The psalmist poet, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear, that I may know, that I may have faith in your name. Theologian Neil Plantinga talks about dividedness with these words. He said, in Scripture, a pure heart is an undivided one. Scriptural writers fear double-mindedness not merely because it shows disloyalty and ingratitude, but also because its perpetrator becomes its victim. Divided worship destroys worshipers. Divided love destroys lovers. To split the truly important longings and loyalties is to crack one's own foundations and invite crumbling and, finally, the disintegration of life itself. A divided house cannot stand. And then riffing on something a friend, Andy Crouch, wrote, tweeted the other day, An adulterer is thrilled and then doomed. God's desire for human beings, for you, for me, is that we have undivided hearts in all of our relationships, primarily with God and then secondarily with those He's given us if we have a significant other, and then also with ourselves. His will is that you love others imaging the way He loves others. And God is wholeheartedly in love with you personally and always faithful. We'll never mess around on you. You don't have to ever worry that you're going to hear one day that God's love for you got taken into another place or or taken away from you in in a way that is abandoning. His love is undivided and completely trustworthy. And I know what it's like when I've experienced it, and maybe you've felt that love too. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You are mine. You belong to me. I'll love you with an everlasting love. With God, you never need fear abandonment. He never lets his people go. You're accepted wholly 
for who you are. I mean, despite the brokenness and the failure, God's grace and love loves you that way. And you're free to live life and to live into the trust of that love. We are meant for that with God and with others, and that is why God says in the seventh commandment, do not commit adultery. You're meant for so much more than that. And as I confessed and have been confessing all week to everybody entering this sermon, I break that commandment all the time. And the truth is, maybe as you hear it flushed out a bit, so do you. We are an adulterous lot. Maybe not in the hotel sense of the word, but there are other ways. You know, men are different than women, right? Men may be visual and physical. Women may be more relational and the way a person has character or integrity or, or listens. Listen to, don't take my word for it, <laughs> Jesus on this. He's talking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were really good at dotting all their spiritual I's and crossing all their faith-based T's. He said, you know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another's spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they are also corrupt. Every woman in the church now thinks about her husband or boyfriend driving down 17th Ave or walking along Memorial by the river in the summer and, you know, that thing going on. Jesus goes on, let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. A little bit of divine hyperbole there to make the point that, yeah, they're different looking at someone and having a thought or a series of thoughts than actually committing adultery physically. But when you look at them lustfully, you do, to some degree, commit adultery nonetheless. I can't imagine Jesus looking at the women that he interacted with lustfully. I can't imagine... You know, the love of God could never do that, right? Would never look at you that way. God the Father making you feel that way when his gaze is upon you. And I know we all struggle with it. Somebody came up to me after church last week and said, I need an answer for this because, like, I'm dead in the water on this command. Could you please come up with that next week? <laughs> I say, well, I've got it figured out. Surely I can share my depth of wisdom and my pure, pure heart with you. He's just so understanding. My husband, my beau, just doesn't listen the way he does or doesn't possess that kind of integrity or that strength or that sense of humor. She's just so alive and vivacious. And they're not the same. They're the same, committing adultery or having a lustful thought. But when it comes to dividing your heart, there really is no difference. To think about it, to imagine to whatever level you imagine connecting with that person, to run a fantasy, one or several, to give away in your mind some of your passion and your heart and your relational energy to another is to divide yourself and your loves and to take away from the one to whom you're supposed to give all those energies. You are made to put all of your thoughts, all of your minds, 
all of your noticing, all of your glances, all of your fantasies into that other person, if you have that other person. So this week, my wife confesses to me, she knows what the topic is, and she's driving down 51st Street by our place, and she sees a guy talking to some other woman, and she notices he's a good-looking guy, and takes a second glance, and while doing the second glance, realizes she was looking at her husband talking to another woman on the street in a good way. <laughs> but that's the way it should be. <laughs> she should be lusting after her husband when she's driving down the street. <laughs> but no, that's what she's made for. She's made to be loved that wholeheartedly. And you're made in the image of a God who loves her that wholeheartedly. So to give your love anywhere else is stealing from God, and it's stealing from her. And women notice, guys, and guys notice women. We are made for fidelity. To be human is to be faithful to another. We're made to know, and I love it when I go there to that place more, the confidence of having good eyes and a settled heart for my wife, for one person. You're, you're made to feel the honor of engaging other human beings of the opposite sex or whoever without objectifying them and lusting after them. You're made to feel... The, the goodness of treating human beings in a way that God treats them. The, the wholeness of that. You're not made to live with the shame that you feel when sometimes you drop the ball or you go too far in a conversation online or texting. You're, you're made to not feel guilt or fracture or, or as though you're deceiving or hiding something. You're ironically uh, made to not feel aloneness, which sometimes is what this bifurcating tendency to lust after others leaves you with. You're made to live not in the fear of getting caught at your computer or caught driving down the street. You know, if I just use my eyes and don't turn my head, she won't notice. or the fear of being caught at that bar or sending those notes. I was at uh, Venice Beach a couple weeks ago at a conference in Pasadena, and I had a day at the end, and just went down to the beach for my Pacific Ocean time, and it was quiet and beautiful, and I'm walking towards the beach, and there's a young couple, and they're just face-to-face -face talking, and I'm going, oh, look at young love, it's so beautiful, until I walked by, and she was livid. She had her back to me, and she was just saying, you mean to say to me that all those texts to her talking about sex were nothing? Do you think I'm a fool, right? And he's foolish enough to actually try to defend himself and say, no, that has nothing, no, there was nothing to that stuff. And obviously, texting, all kinds of adultery was playing out. And my heart just kind of broke for them. And I don't think we have any idea how much God's heart breaks for us, for them. When what could be is falling short. That's not what desire is made for, God says. It's not what the other person is made for. It's not what you were made for. So, to that guy's question from last week, what's the solution? Um... Like Jesus said, let's not pretend it's easier than it really is. Can we stop it? Can we rein in our desires? Is there a way to better position our lives so that this adulterous propensity is at least lessened? Three antidotes came to mind as I struggled with those questions. First, I think we need to realize that when committing adultery at whatever level we do, we're really messing around on God when we do that. In two ways. We're meant to be wholeheartedly in love with God, 
And so living in disobedience to God by lusting after others and breaking the seventh commandment is turning away from him and saying, I love porn more than I love you, God. I love staring, I love fantasizing, I love flirting more than I love you. In the Old Testament, when God was really upset with the people of Israel, they were akin to prostitutes whoring it around in the their worship of other gods and committing adultery and their idolatry. The second way we commit adultery on God when we lust after another person is we are lusting after a person that belongs to God. So that person is God's person that he loves with an unending love and has given his whole heart to and feels toward even in in, in an even greater sense than any marriage or the perfect romance could ever feel. He feels towards that person that you're now cutting in on and objectifying because you want the quick fix of a leer or a look or an emotional touch. He understands me. She understands me. You're lustfully cutting in on that relationship which when I had that thought this week really made me gulp (laughs) big time. John, you are objectifying and fooling around with God's loved one, even if you have a thought. Second antidote that came to me is that we need to realize that you're not going to control your desires by stifling them. I think there is a place for trying to keep things reined in, but I don't think that's the ultimate answer for your desires. I think you need to aim your desires in the right direction and let them go fully to your loved one and to God, and then they'll be giving expression in their fullness, which is what they're meant for. It hit me a couple months ago that adultery is fueled by an insatiable desire for something new, a desire that can only be satisfied by an infinite God who's always new, so that you're always wanting something new relationally has to be that way because you're made to know God who's infinite and you're going to be knowing new every day forever. It hit me as I was sitting at the lights just at the corner here and uh, a a, a very attractive woman walking across the crosswalk and I'm listening to all these music so the song You Make Me Feel Brand New is playing on the radio and at the same time I'm sitting in a cafe with a guy who was committing adultery two years ago and he's telling me about this I feel so new and alive and this is what I was meant for and this is the right person he was totally uh, totally in this illusory place but what was what was feeding the illusion was his passion for something new relationally and I thought maybe that's it we're made for you God and That passion goes in these adulterous directions instead. You're the only one who's ever knew and only enough for me, God. Completely enough. Third remedy, last one, is an old school one. Uh, But it works. Trust me. (laughs) Uh, It can change, it can move you from this place to this place by the grace of God and change things dramatically if you engage it in a humble way. And this way is confession to God that I am screwed on this issue in my life and I cannot save myself and I need your grace. King David in the Bible is the story, right, of the ultimate adultery event. While his armies are going off to war and King David ought to have been leading his armies, King David's first mistake was he stays home and walking the top of his palace, looks out one night, sees somebody else's wife bathing, has her brought up to the palace boudoir they 
have their adulterous moment. She gets pregnant. He then sends a note to the general, send the husband back so he can visit with his wife so that he can think he got her pregnant so that my sin can be covered up. Only the soldier is so honorable to his king and to his troops that he says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sleep outside of the house because if these guys are still at war, then... And so he, David can't get out of it that way. So he then calls the general again and he says, put him up near the front of the battle so that he'll get killed. And King David murders the husband of the woman he committed adultery with in order to cover. So deluded was he about who he was and the, the, so powerful was that call to do what he did that he was able to have a man killed and God saw the whole thing of course and God sent a prophet Nathan to him God was not at all pleased with, with what David had done and sent Nathan to David Nathan said to him, there were, he tells him a parable, a story to catch him in his sin. There were two men in the same city, one rich, the other poor. And the rich man had huge flocks of sheep, herds of cattle. The poor man had nothing but one little female lamb, which he had, brought, which he had bought and raised. And it grew up with him and his children as a member of the family. It ate off his plate and drank from his cup and slept on his bed. It was like a daughter to him. One day, a traveler dropped in on the rich man. He was too stingy to take an animal from his own herds or flocks to make a meal for his visitor, so he took the poor man's lamb and prepared a meal to set before his guest. King David exploded in anger. As surely as God lives, he said to Nathan, the, the man who did this ought to be lynched. He must repay for the lamb four times over his crime and his stinginess. And then Nathan, you imagine, making eye contact with King David, said, you're the man. You're the man. Like, you're the woman. We, we are those people. He got totally sideswiped, David. I know what that's like. <laughs> what he didn't see in himself got brutally exposed and needs to be. The deception that we're all just fine and this is not my issue, and maybe, what do I know? Maybe it isn't your issue. But the deception that I think most of us are living with needs to be exposed. We have to own reality on this front before God and name it, sometimes with brutal honesty. Not minimize it, not deny it, not sweep it under some bed somewhere. King David We'll finish with this. Wrote of his experience in a poem, Psalm 51, and prayed, I believe, trust, and then wrote down, heart felt, heart laid open, life laid open before God, words. So I'm going to read those to close, and your job, I guess, is just to listen. And if you can, make them your words. They're his words, but they're inspired by the Spirit of God and true for all human beings. Take them into yourself, and then I'll say a prayer. And I'm going to start with just a few seconds of very uncomfortable silence. Generous in love, God, give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record.
Scrub away my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. You're the one I've violated. And you've seen it all. Seen the full extent of my evil, my choices. You have all the facts before you. And whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step with you for a long time, in the wrong since before I was born. What you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me, then. Conceive a new true life. Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me and I'll have a snow-white life. Tune me in to foot-tapping songs. Set these once broken bones to dancing. Don't look too close for blemishes. Give me a clean bill of health. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from gray exile and put a fresh wind in my sails. Give me a job teaching rebels your way so that the lost can find their way home. Commute my death sentence, God, my salvation, God, and I'll sing anthems to your life-giving ways Unbutton my lips, dear God. I'll let loose with your praise. Going through the motions doesn't please you. A flawless performance, it's nothing to you. I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. Heart-shattered lives, ready for love, don't for a moment escape God's notice. Make Zion uh, the holy place where God is and everything is the way God wills and made for it and means for it and one day we'll make it to be again. Make Zion the place you delight in. Repair Jerusalem's broken down walls. Then you'll get real worship from us, God. Real people again. Acts of worship, small and large. Let's pray. But for your grace, God, uh, there go all of us following uh, King David and the King Davids and the Jezebels and the others and the men and the women who uh, fall in this area and continue to fall in this area of this seventh commandment. It's hard to imagine knowing who we are in these regards, let alone the other nine commandments, that you continue to choose to look on us with love And through Christ, see us clean again, whiter than snow. And through the forgiveness that we get, through the gospel that he preached and the kingdom that he proclaimed, we get a new start and new life. And we get to see the next day again. The the depth of depravity is a profound pointer to the, to the magnificence and the wonder of your grace. So let that grace be the final word here. May the confession lead to a renewal and a, an increased clarity hearing your voice saying, you're mine, you belong to me, you're meant for this. And then out of that place, help us to go out today into your world and this week into life. With a 
practiced and powerful sense of the presence of God, seeing it all, forgiving it all, loving us wholly uh, with an undivided heart uh, in a trustworthy way now and forevermore. Help us to know that, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.